I am live. Oh, <laughs> okay. Hello. <laughs> My name is Kynan. I wanted to officially welcome you to the CozyCon mini events. Um, yeah, so I am going to show you stuff about um, using your sewing machine and doing cool things with it. Um, I've been sewing ever since I was a little kid, but I learned only the very basic kind of stuff from my um, grandma. So I found it really exciting to keep learning new things all the time. And so I've learned so many new things now that I just wanted to like share it all with you because it's fun. Hello, friends. <laughs> um, yeah, so some of you might know me as KG Wolf, um, my main persona. And it's, um, I also make fursuits um, for I, my shop's called Marky Martin, so there's some examples there of what I'm doing. Um, okay, so I have a lot of stuff to get through in this panel, and I'm not sure one hour is enough time, so let's get started, because <laughs> uh, I want to show you things. So, and also I want to say that this panel kind of assumes you have a very basic understanding of how to use a sewing machine, so it's not going to be talking about, like, the, the you know, nitty-gritty of how to make it actually work. It's kind of like a little bit more advanced techniques and stuff. So anyways, sorry, I'm kind of stressed that I've never done this before. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to start with um, some of the tools that I love to use for sewing. Um, the first thing I'm going to show you is this thing called, it's called That Purple Thing is like literally the name of this tool. <laughs> um, but I'm obsessed with this thing. It's just like this weird little plastic uh thingy and it's really right, nice for being able to like if you have fabric that you're trying to feed through the machine it can hold stuff in place so that your finger's not in the way and getting like crushed by stuff or it can also go like this to kind of guide stuff through so it's less bunching up um, it's also nice for if you're trying to bring up the bobbin thread like this um, you can reach underneath and like get those threads out, which is really great. Um, it also can help you if you're sewing it with pins. Um, it can help you if you if this pin is like right here, and I'm like, oh, I can't get it with my finger. You can use this to just kind of like pull it out, which is very useful. Um, I know my things are really small, and it's kind of hard to see, so I apologize for that. But that's. Um, that's this tool called That Purple Thing, which is such a stupid name, but it's very useful. Um, I'm going to also talk about, um, okay, so something you need to have is really small pointed scissors um, or snips or embroidery scissors, something like that, um, where the they get pretty small at the tip. So this is when, if you're like sewing along and you want to cut off the threads really small, or if you need to do this and that, like it's very annoying to use like a huge normal kind of like scissors to do that so you got to have some of these I use them all the time um, another thing is you'll need a seam ripper so a lot of machines will come with their own little mini seam ripper and you can buy these too where it's like a teeny tiny cool compact thing and it goes like this but um, if you do a lot of sewing you're gonna have to rip out a lot of seams or like change out things, the little mistakes that you made. It's just inevitable. So, um, this, these little ones make me really annoyed and I hate using those for big tasks. So I recommend getting a full size one if you are doing a lot of sewing. So there's that. Um, I recommend having some good tweezers. <laughs> These are really good for if there's like threads that you need to get through or if you're trying to thread a little weird needle or just like maybe you're cleaning out your machine and there's some lint way down in there and you want to get this like big bunch of fuzz you can like grab it and pull it out. I also use it if I'm pulling out stitches, um, cut them with the seam ripper and then I can use these to get those little bits of thread that's still left to get it all like out and clean. It's way easier than trying to use your fingers and pinch thread. So I recommend having some of those. Uh, another thing that I like uh, <laughs> uh, is having a 
some sort of turning tool. So this came with my bag of like poly stuffing. Um, it's basically just a chopstick. It's like one of those ones that's super round and it's smooth. And so I love using this for turning things inside out. So like this was a claw that I was making earlier. And so you sew it from the wrong side so that the seams don't show when you turn it inside out. So I recommend having something like this because it can really help you get those little points turned inside out nice and sharp. It also helps you take stuffing and like shove it into little corners of spaces, which is nice. Um, this is a cool tool, which is a point turner on one side, so it can do the same similar sort of thing. It also can, it has this kind of flat edge, so it can help like make a nice, like, like another thing for turning, but not for a point, maybe for like a nice seam. It also can help you crease folds. So like s instead of having to iron everything all the time, if you want to have like a nice crease, um, you can finger press, which is called this, or you can use something like this tool, which makes it nice because you can like make a nice crisp edge like that. Uh, I don't really know what this tool is called. It might be called just like a turner um, or creaser or something like that. This is kind of like a multiple one for that. Another thing I like is if you're doing a lot of these kind of tools or uh, like mm, making creases and seams and stuff like that, um, this is a seam roller. So this is really helpful. You make a, like a crease like that and then you can like instead of having to iron the crease. So it makes like a really nice crease like that, which is cool. Or if you sew a seam and you are trying to press open the seam allowance on the other side, it's really good for that. Super useful. So I like having that. It's definitely not an essential tool, but it's something I like having, especially if you do a lot of creasing and seams and things. Yeah, tweezers are great for sergers. Um, I also have a serger and so it's like you just you have to do that for like threading little teeny tiny needles and stuff. Okay, so those are my main normal tools. So now we're going to talk about uh, things like sewing clips. So you might if you've seen it or done any sort of fursuit making stuff, you've probably seen people using these little clips. They're little plastic clips. Sometimes they're called wonder clips. Um, they're little sewing clips and they're so useful for um, uh, holding your, it, you use them instead of pins basically. And they're really great for fur because um, they can hold a lot of thick layers of fur together very tightly without being this warpy weird thing if you're trying to use a pin or um, like if you use a bunch of pins, they can like poke you and stuff. Um, a lot of people that do quilting love to use these instead of pins. So I highly recommend getting sewing uh, clips, um, especially if you're working with fur. I use them all the time and I have like huge bucket full of them. Uh, you do also want to have some pins though. Um, so there's different kinds of pins. I like to have a variety of different ones. There's like kind of a regular length one. That, this one, I think they have glass tips, which I think is for if you're ironing on them, they won't like melt. But then there's like kind of more standard ones with a big plastic ball on the end. Um, there's really teeny, teeny, tiny ones. And I like ones called quilting pins because they're much longer in length. So they can be really good. Here's a comparison. So they can be really good for when you just like have a lot of layers to deal with or, or things like that. And then there's also ones that are flat head pins. Um, they are nice for when you're sewing. They don't get in the way so much if you're trying to, you know, have your presser foot go over stuff that you're pinning. Okay, so those are pins. And then, um, oh yeah, for scissors, I highly, highly, highly recommend having a pair of scissors that is only for cutting fabric um, compared to your normal scissors where you might cut things like um, paper and stuff. It keeps the scissors much sharper for longer 
um, because you really want sharp scissors for cutting through fabric um, so it doesn't snag and get all messed up. So I usually have a, one or two pairs of scissors and I label them and they're fabric only. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Um, there's various tools you can use to mark your um, mark on fabric. Um, a few of them that I like, you can get um, pens that have special water erasing ink. So make sure you're, what you're using. Um, in most situations, you want to use stuff that's meant for fabric. Otherwise, it might stain or, or like bleed, or otherwise kind of mess up your your fabric. So these one, this one's a water erasing pen, so you can mark a mark and then it will stay there until you wash the, the fabric and then it'll go away. There's also these handy cool air erasing pens that you can get. I love my air erasing pen. So basically what you do is you make a mark and then it'll slowly fade over time in the air and magically disappear. Um, there's also, I actually don't like using Taylor's chalk at all. Um, there's those wedges you can buy and then sometimes there's like pencils you can buy with like a chalk kind of interior thing. Those are really annoying to me, especially since I mostly work with fur. But what I love is this is called a Choco pen that's by the company called Clover. And so it's basically like powdered chalk inside and it has a little tip with like a metal thing that rolls. And so basically, you can roll it along and it makes a little dusty chalk line. And then that can just wash away, which is super useful. So those are some marking tools that I love to use. Um, I will say don't use Sharpie on fur if you're making fursuits um, because it can, um, if a lot of people will use an alcohol-based spray or cleaner um, for cleaning their fursuits um, and that will make the Sharpie ink run if it's in the fur. It'll make it and it can like really stain and damage the fur and you'll never get it out. So highly recommend not using Sharpie if you're marking on fur. Um, okay, so another thing I'm obsessed with are sewing uh, pattern weights. These I love. You can kind of make something yourself similar, um, but these are some actual ones I bought. Sorry, I have fuzz in my face, which is the life of a fursuit maker. Uh, <laughs> sewing weights are super awesome for when you're trying to trace a pattern. Um, basically, if you have a pattern, you just you put it on the... They just hold the pattern down without having to do anything weird or special, and then you can trace around it. So I love using these. I have a whole bunch of them and I use them all the time, especially for fur where it's all like kind of bunched up and thick. Okay, let's see. And then lastly over here I have, you wanna have a flexible measuring tape. These are very common for doing sewing and stuff. For measuring stuff, you, you need to have one that's flexible. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so what's next? Oh yeah, and then I also keep, I have a container that I made, um, this is just a glass mason jar, but I made a little lid for it where I can stick my used X-Acto knife blades and my used sewing machine needles in there and store them so that I can eventually take it to metal recycling. Um, because I will show you that you need to change your uh, sewing machine needle fairly often. Um, so I like to have something easy to hold those used up needles. Okay, so now let's move on to care and maintenance. Um, so when you have your machine, uh, you want to make sure that you thread your machine correctly. Um, it's very easy to miss a little step, if, especially if you're not super used to your machine. Um, if you don't have a sewing machine manual for your t uh, machine, I, you should look it up online and try to download a version of it because um, you need to read your like, manual and make sure you're doing it correctly. If you don't thread your machine correctly, it can make messed up or uneven stitches, or it can even kind of like mess up the machine over time by like pulling in things in places where it shouldn't. So um, 
make sure you thread your <laughs> machine correctly. Um, all the little bits from this take up lever part, any little guidelines. A lot of machines these days have arrows on them to show you how to do it. Um, there's these little like guides here and here they need to make sure you get to. So, oh yes, and when you're threading your machine, make sure your presser foot is up. So your presser foot will be down while you're sewing, but do not thread your machine when the presser foot's down. Only thread it when the presser foot's up because um, otherwise you won't get the thread within the tension discs correctly because when the presser foot's down, the tension discs squeeze together. So you want to thread your machine with the presser foot up. Um, when you're changing threads or you're done with a thread or something like that, don't um, pull the thread backwards through the machine. It's much better for the care and maintenance of your machine if you snip at the spool and then pull the remaining length of thread um, out the way that it would normally come out through sewing. It's just better for the machine even though it feels like a waste of thread. Uh, and also make sure you're using the correct type of spool cap. Um, a lot of machines will come with more than one. Like these. So you want to get use the spool cap that is um, bigger than the spool that you're using, but not like too huge. So the reason why you want it to be bigger is because spools will have like little catches for thread or little bumps or something, and you don't want the thread to snag on it while you're sewing. So that's why you want a spool cap that's a little bigger. Um, and then for a smaller spool like this, use a smaller one. Okay, let's see. Oh yes, they're staring. I also realized that your viewpoint is just like, you just have double dog butts. So I apologize for that. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna talk about thread. Um, you wanna use good quality thread. Uh, I recommend Guterman or Mettler or uh, like a higher quality brand like that. Um, do not use Coates and Clark or really cheap brands. Like I highly recommend not using those. They are more economical, but the way they make the thread is more like little pieces of fibers like kind of put together instead of um, the higher quality threads. It's like one continuous fiber. And so the cheap threads like Coates and Clark and things like that, they tend to lint up a lot more inside your machine. Um, the thread will just kind of shred in your machine a bit more and make it much more um, linty inside of there, which you don't want. And they're also weaker generally, so they can break off in different points um, in your machine and things like that. So please use a high quality thread. Also, do not use old thread, old, old spools of thread that you find at garage sales and stuff like that. Maybe they're cute and stuff like that. But if a thread is like several years old, it starts to kind of deteriorate over time and it'll be the same thing where it will lint up your machine. So you want to not bulk up on tons of thread. Don't buy cheap thread. Don't buy garage sale thread. <laughs> you want really good thread. This That is a point where you don't want to skimp um, when it comes to money. Because I know not everybody is going to be at the same kind of economic level of being able to afford things financially, but thread you don't want to um, scrimp on. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so I recommend using a polyester, 100% polyester thread for most of your projects. So if you're just everyday kind of things, doing fursuits or just like everyday sewing, I would use 100% polyester. That's like, you can usually find that is like the main type of thread. 100% cotton thread is usually what quilters like to use sometimes for if they're sewing like a, an all, like a cotton fabric quilt. It, it, there's things that are, if you just really are very, um, if you really wanna use like natural fibers and th things like that, uh, but just for normal sewing, use polyester thread. It's stronger and, um, more freely available and everything. And it doesn't soak up um, all the water when you're washing it either. Okay, so, beep, bop, boop. We're gonna talk about 
uh, needles. So another thing about needles is that's another one where you want to buy good quality needles. I use Schmetz needles. Um, another good brand is Oregon brand needles. Um, you want to change your sewing machine uh, needle fairly often. There's no like real hard rule for when it, you change it, um, but some people say like change it after every project, but like a project can be all kinds of different. It has so many meanings that it can have. So um, if it feels like it's been a while since you change your needle, you want to change the needle because um, it will get dull over time because it's like punching into the fabric all the time. Um, so you want to use a nice fresh sharp needle so that it because it can actually kind of slowly over time damage your machine slightly if you're using old ma machine needles because it will have to punch really hard to get a dull needle through fabric. Um, so you want to do that. So since uh, and just take it out like that, easy peasy, and then uh, you put in a new one. So I like to keep these little needle things like in your sewing machine, little caddy that generally the machines have. Like that. So then you have a fresh needle. Also change it if it gets like bent or if it breaks or gets damaged or if something happened while you're sewing and it hit the presser foot or it hit the needle plate or something like that. Change your needle, have a fresh one. There's also different sizes of needles. I would say for most kinds of sewing, when you're doing, um, especially if you're doing like just fursuit making or things just kind of sewing clothes and stuff, a lot of time you'll just want to use universal needles, um, but there's different sizes. Um, I like to use 9014 size. Um, a lot of people use 8012 size too. Um, the bigger the number, the thicker the needle. Um, so a higher number is really good for thicker, more tough fabrics, and you'll want a lower number often for a lot thinner, more delicate fabrics. Um, but I use 9014, and that's what I use for almost everything that I sew, and so I actually bought like a huge pack of these because I sew a lot. <laughs> Whoops. There's also different kinds of needles. You probably want to use universal for most of your things, but there's things like jersey needles, um, also called ballpoint needles. Those ones have a slightly rounded tip for th for special fabrics like knit fabrics, um, t-shirt kind of fabrics, so that it doesn't punch, like cut a hole through it. Instead, it just goes between the fibers. But most of the time, you're just gonna wanna use universal needles. Okay, I see. Mm. We're going to talk about bobbins. All right, so bobbins, um, there's different sizes of bobbins, so make sure you know what size your machine wants and only use that size of bobbin. Um, so that's another thing where if you're not sure, you need to look at your sewing machine manual and make sure you're using the right one. Um, so like, here's an example. These are two different sizes of bobbins. So this is the size that my um, Burnett uses, and this is the size that my old um, Faf uses. So you want to use the right one, otherwise it won't work very well for your machine. Also don't use a bobbin. If it breaks or gets chipped or something like that, um, bent or whatever, it's the same thing with needles. Um, don't use that bobbin anymore because it can damage your machine if you keep using it. So make sure you have fresh, good bobbins. Um, when you're winding a bobbin on your machine, do it on the machine. <laughs> Don't do it by hand because you want a neatly wound bobbin for um, your machine sewing. So you want it to be nice and even and it won't look like this if you're trying to do it by hand. Um, and don't over fill it. So a lot of sewing machines um, on their bobbin winding part, um, I can't show you, uh, maybe I can show you on this camera there'll be a little thing generally that you can just slowly to, to make it um, stop the bobbin winder. So you want to be, you want to test it with your bobbin and make sure that it stops um, your winding right before the edge so it doesn't get overfilled. Okay, let's see. 
Oh, and there's also like different kinds of bobbins in terms of plastic ones or metal ones. You only want to use the type of bobbin, plastic or metal, that your machine came with and is supposed to use. So even if it's the same size, don't use a metal bobbin if your machine is supposed to use plastic ones. Okay. I think that's it for bobbins. Oh, and also thread them correctly too. It's another thing where you want to make sure according to your sewing machine's manual, and sometimes they have like guides on the machine these days too. You want to thread it properly. Make sure the bobbin's facing the right direction when you put it in, and make sure you follow the guide the right way for how the thread goes. Um, it makes a difference, so you want to do it correctly. Um, okay. Um, if you, so if you use the hand wheel for things, um, make sure, so this is the hand wheel and this is, it rotates when this, the needle goes up and down. Um, so it does that while you're sewing and especially on old fashioned machines, um, you have to use the hand wheel a lot for changing where the needle position is. Um, try to always p turn the hand wheel toward you because that's the direction of the machine normally sewing. So you want hand wheel direction to be turned toward you. <laughs> okay, for cleaning. Okay, so for cleaning, you wanna refer to your manual and see what it tells you to clean and where and how. Um, some machines, a lot of modern machines, they don't want you to get into the workings of it very much. And so they kind of don't make it easy to access. And so um, like I had an old sewing machine where this whole top part kind of swung open and you can get into the middle and clean out stuff. But this machine, the only thing I can do really is take off this needle plate, um, which I think probably all machines allow you to do. So. Um, mine have screws, some of them pop off. There's different ways to take off the needle plate, but you want to open that up and clean out um, lint every once in a while in there. Because uh, they'll get all linty. So you'll want to have little tools and brushes and stuff that can get into the linty parts and pull out um, big bunches of fluff. Um, you'll want something that can unscrew the little screws. A lot of sewing machines will come with a tool like that, um, but I also like to have like a small screwdriver to do it myself because these are annoying to hold. Um, you can also, I love this teeny tiny, I think it's called the world's smallest vacuum or something like that, but this is a teeny tiny um, vacuum uh, that is USB powered and I, I think it's meant for keyboards <laughs> cleaning, but I love it for cleaning out little weird little parts in your sewing machine. When you're trying to clean, don't shove your brushes and stuff way down into holes you can't see because it can just push the lint further down in there. Just clean what you can see in there. Um, if your machine wants you to uh, oil it regularly, make sure you use only the oil type of oil that your machine specifies to use. Make sure you only use sewing machine oil. Do not use olive oil or other kind of cooking oils because that can really gum up and mess up the um, mechanical workings. Do not use compressed air to clean out your machine either. Um, compressed air can just shove lint deeper into the machine. Um, and it also, I've heard that it can, um, it has like what's in it is something that can add moisture into the machine and that's not good for it. So don't use compressed air. Um, okay. And then also get your um, machine serviced regularly. It costs a lot and it's annoying to do, but if you sew a lot pretty regularly, um, you probably want to try to service your machine at least once a year. Not at least, you probably don't need to do more than that. Um, try to do it once a year. Um, because the service technicians, so you, you get that done at like a sewing machine store or something like that, repair shop or something. Um, they basically can tune up your machine. They can open the machine all up and get lint out of the weird, crazy places that you can't reach. And they can like oil the places that you're, um, you can't get to and things like that. And they basically keep it running in tip top machine shape. So you want to get it serviced regularly. Um, because they can get to stuff that you can't. Okay, 
when not in use, um, you want to unplug your machine from the socket and you also want to have a dust cover kind of thing uh, so that lint and dust and everyday stuff don't just like fall and collect into your machine. So make sure you have some sort of cover or something to keep your machine all cozy. Um, and then if you're storing it for a while, um, try not to store it with the thread, um, the top thread all threaded in the machine because uh, it can add more lint over time. So you just want to uh, take that out if it's going to be a while before you use your sewing machine next. Okay, so all right, so we got through the care and maintenance, which is good because it looks like we have just under half an hour left. We're going to try to run through <laughs> what different presser feet are for the machine. So this is the normal kind of presser foot that you'll use for a lot of stuff. Most stuff, um, it's generally what will be already installed in your machine. This is called a zigzag foot. Um, because it has this kind of notch in here that allows you to do a zigzag stitch so the needle can go back and forth. So you use that for most things, um, most sewing. I recommend doing a, um, making it like a stitch sampler thing um, for your machine for the straight stitches and the zigzag stitches especially. Um, because different stitch lengths, this will be nice. You always do want to test on whatever fabric and stuff you're using um, for the project that you're doing, but uh, it's nice to have something to look at and remember like what does 3.5 length mean compared to, you know, 1.5. You can see the difference. So it's nice to have something to look at and helps you get to know your machine better. Same with zigzag stitches. It's best to make a sampler for like how wide the zigzag stitch is and then how long the zigzag stitch is. Mm, other way around for that. <laughs> Whoops, okay. So I recommend doing a sampler. So most of the things that you'll sew, you can use just this normal zigzag foot. Let's see, let's get my machine threaded. Oh, that's another thing why I like this purple thing for it's if you use the automatic needle threader thingy um, that some machines have built in, it helps you get the thread through the needle. <laughs> okay. So. Okay, another thing that's for care and maintenance, don't sew over pins. Um, a lot of people sew over pins and say it's fine and stuff, but it really is not good for the machine, especially if your needle hits the pin or hits ne next to the pin or things like that. It can kind of mess up your machine slowly over time. Uh, my sewing machine, people that I take my machine to for maintenance says they had someone who um, w kept having to come get their machine fixed up like every few months or so. And then they realized that she was sewing over pins. And once they told her to not do that, she didn't have to bring it in all the time anymore. <laughs> so try to not sew over pins. You want to practice and then get used to um, taking pins out while you sew. So uh, when you start sewing, it's, it's good to hold the ends of the um, threads at first because it helps not get the threads all caught up where you're sewing. So I like to do that. But uh, what you want to try to do, I guess it's hard to see. I wish you could sew, show better. How about that? Um, you want to take pins out as you sew. So like that, and like that, so. Make it a habit, don't sew over pins. Okay, let's see. Um, let's see. And then the same goes for clips. Pretty much can't sew over clips, so it's good practice for learning to not sew over pins if you've gotten used to doing that. Um, clips you just take out as you sew. Like that. Easy peasy. Okay, 
Let's see. Um, all right, so let's talk about um, some special presser feet. So this one is called a straight stitch foot. Um, when you're doing straight stitches normally, you can use this one just fine, um, your zigzag foot. But if you're doing sometimes a straight stitch foot, if you're only doing straight stitching, um, it can be nice because so the zigzag foot has more holes in different areas to for the you know needle to move around and stuff but the straight stitch foot just has a hole for the needle to stitch straightly <laughs> it's like a weird tongue twister um, so it means that there's more presser foot pressing against the fabric so that when fabric is moving along it helps it so that the top and bottom layers move together instead of something getting out of sync because there's more space for the top layer to move around in, in this one. So um, I don't use this a whole lot, but if I'm doing a lot of only straight stitching for certain kind of projects, sometimes it's nice to use. Um, but make sure you don't accidentally switch to a zigzag stitch or any other kind of stitch because it will hit this metal part and break your needle. But that's a specialty thing that's kind of cool. All right. so. Um, for zigzag stitches, usually you want to use your normal zigzag foot, uh, but if you're doing what's called a satin stitch, which you might be familiar with doing if you d make fursuit hand paws or something like that, where you're, or you're doing any kind of machine applique, a satin stitch is base it's just a zigzag stitch, but with the stitches really, really close together. So you can use that for appliqueing like one thing on top of another. And in that case, it's best to use a satin stitch foot. So the thing with these is that the toe part is open further apart. Oh my goodness, I need to hurry up because I have so many things to go through. <laughs> satin stitch foot. It has more space so that you can see what you're doing with the satin stitch as you go along. And, um, and then also there's more space for it so that the machine foot is not kind of like blah, 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 over the stitching that you're doing. So that's what that is. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, so there's those and those. Okay, next we're going to talk about patchwork foot, also known as a quarter inch foot. So this one, it has a built in guide, this little metal blogger thing. Um, these are cool because they help you make exactly a quarter inch seam. Um, it's good if you're doing like quilting or patchwork where you want precise quarter inch seams. It helps you guide the fabric along, or you can do like nice quarter inch like lines all evenly spaced by using it as a guide. So basically you can put your fabric, you butt your fabric up to the edge of the guide. It's hard to see here, but the guide is there, put it up against the edge. Um, and And then you you just eye it and make sure you keep the edge against that little guide. And then you have a beautiful quarter inch seam. So I really like the patchwork foot. I think it's super cool. All right, another cool foot with a guide that's similar is the edge stitching foot. Edge stitch foot has the guide in the very middle. So this one can help you it can help you top stitch um, on top of seam. So if you sew a seam, I guess I don't have an example. Let's see, if you sew a seam um, and then you want to top stitch over the seam, this help can help you guide along the edge and make really nice even, like keep it uh, evenly from the edge. Anyway, doing a narrow top stitching. I could speak English. Another thing that this stitch is used for, sometimes it's called a stitch in the ditch foot, which um, is a thing that quilters sometimes use where you can um, sew along and you use the guide. You hold it up right in the middle. If you're attaching like your back of your quilt fabric to the top of your stitched patchwork squares or something like that, you can use the guide to go right over the seams you already sewed. So it can attach the things together, but hide that new line of stitching you see in the seam. 
So that's what's stitching in the ditches. So that's um, another use for this foot. Okay. Okie dokie, let's see. We're gonna talk about sewing a button with the button foot. This is a button foot for my machine. Um, it's super cool. It has two bars. So there's different kinds of ways of attaching um, these feet to your machine. Um, what I'm familiar with is snap-on feet, which is what these are. Um, but there's other ones where you have to do all these other fancy things. So I don't know how to do those and I don't have familiarity with them. So if your machine uses something else, um, read the manual. <laughs> But I use, I have snap-on feet for my machines. So, um, a button foot can sew a button on really nice and easy, which is super awesome. Um, basically, it has little grips on the bottom so it can hold the button in place. When you're using a button foot, you want to lower the feed dogs. So the feed dogs, the feed dogs are these part in the bottom here that they're like the little metal grippy things that move the fabric along as you sew. Well, you don't want the fabric to move when you're sewing a button on. So the feed dogs, um, there'll be a way on your machine to lower it. On my machine, it's I have to take out this part and then switch this lever. It makes those things go down so that they can't um, touch the fabric. So you wanna do that for a button. So there. It holds the button in place, which is super useful. Um, you'll want to use a zigzag stitch to go between, and you want to be really careful with your stitch um, width so that you don't hit the button and damage either the button or your needle or both. So you'll want to carefully use the hand wheel to make sure that it goes in that hole and that it goes in the other hole without um, hitting anything. So you just do a few stitches once you have it the right size. That way, turn it. If it's a four hole button, do a few stitches the other way. Super useful, super cool for sewing on buttons because they're super annoying to do by hand. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I love it in here. Um, <laughs> it makes me really happy. I love all the daylight. I love having all of my colors that I can see. Okay, so we're gonna raise the feed dogs again to show the next foot. Next one I'm gonna show you is a buttonhole foot. Your machine probably came with one. Um, there's all different kinds of the ways that they look and kind of operate, um, so I'm not gonna run over those because I really don't know. But mine um, has a slider, which is really cool, where you can put the button in it, and that then automatically tells your machine how long of a buttonhole to make. So you don't have to guess it yourself, which is super, super cool. You just put the button in there and it's like, okay, I make one for that button. Um, yeah, so when you use a buttonhole foot, um, your, I don't know how to do it super manually, but my machine has like a setting for that and it just automatically does it, which is super cool and awesome and easy. Um, it'll sew this kind of shape automatically. And then what you wanna do is at the end of each of these kind of whole things, you'll wanna put a pin on each side and then you can use your seam ripper to carefully cut out the middle part and then the pins will keep you from accidentally cutting into the stitching either way. Or if you make lots and lots of buttonholes, you probably want to get a buttonhole cutter tool because it makes it a lot easier. You can also use it in X-Acto knife, I guess, too, but the pins are nice for making sure you don't cut the stitches. Yeah, so that's a buttonhole foot. Um, okay, so I'm not gonna show zippers, um, but because they're, they're kind of complicated and annoying to do, but um, there's lots of tutorials online. But basically there's gonna be two different kinds of zipper feet. One is the standard zipper foot for showing, uh, sewing your everyday normal zipper. 
And then the other kind is an invisible zipper foot. It's shaped differently because it's specifically for sewing invisible zippers, which are zippers where um, you sew them in place and you can see how it kind of hides into the fabric and so you don't see the zipper so much in the back of the fabric. So that foot is for sewing that kind of zipper. Okay. Okay, next is... Oh goodness, okay, we can do this. Next is a non-stick foot, or sometimes they might be called a Teflon foot or something like that. These are cool. Um, they have a, a surface that's very slippery. So you'll want to use this if you're sewing on certain kinds of fabric that might kind of stick while you're sewing. So for instance, this kind of fake leathery stuff, or if you're sewing on vinyl or like a plasticky kind of thing or leather, um, a nonstick foot is great because um, it won't catch on the top. So I made an example earlier here where when I use a nonstick foot and sew this zigzag stitch, it sews correctly. But if I used my normal zigzag foot, it's the same settings, but the top gets caught on the foot because it's sticky. And so um, the stitch doesn't come out right. So yeah, so these are cool and definitely something you want to look at if you're sewing like finals and leathers. Okay, let's see. Um, we're going to look at some special cool feet. This is a he hemming foot hemmer, um, rolled hem foot. Um, what it does is while you sew, so you'll have your raw edge, but if you feed it into this thing correctly, then while you sew, it will just magically make a hem and then stitch it in place. Um, mine that came with, that I bought from my machine is pretty narrow, but you can get ones that are kind of different, different widths, but mine makes a really, really narrow, nice hem. Super easy and nice for efficient hemming like that. Um, let's see. This is a specialty foot um, that isn't necessarily needed for doing a blind stitch, but is useful if you, if you want that extra little kind of guide thing. This is a blind stitch foot. So this one, um, it has a little guide and the guide can move you can use the screw to kind of move it narrow or wider or something like that. And that's so you can test and gauge what, um, where you want your guide to be for doing a blind stitch. So, um, your machine might have a blind stitch setting. Mine, uh, it might look like this in the little pattern thing for your guide. It's weird looking. Um, but the way that it works is that, okay. So say you're making an, a, a normal hem. You can fold it over once and then you fold it over again to have your nice hem with the raw edge contained. Then what you do is you turn it over and you fold over so that just a little bit of that hem is showing on the other side. That's where you should sew your blind stitch. So when you sew it, it will be looking like this. It has a few straight stitches and then it does a zigzag over to the left, which you want to, it to just barely pierce that other layer of fabric. And so you do it carefully and slowly. So it's only just getting it. Then when it's done and you turn it over to the normal way, when you use coordinating thread, these stitches kind of magically fade away into your fabric so that it's how you can do a hem without showing a seam line on this side, the nice side of the fabric. So that's what a blind stitch is. It's kind of a cool, cool way to hem magically. Yeah, so there's a foot for that if you want it to help you. Okay, let's see. There is these special foots. So um, a couching foot or a ribbon couching foot. Um, that's what this one is. So basically what it has is a special little slot that you can feed in your cord or your ribbon or whatever. This is twill tape. Um, and then you can sew over that. So if you're sewing like a thick cord on, you can do like a, a wide zigzag stitch. 
so that you can show the cord through it or um, with tape or ribbon you can sew a decorative stitch over it if you want and it basically just feeds it in place um, and then you stitch on top which is pretty neat uh, my machine also came with another one that they called a cording foot and then this one has really teeny tiny narrow slots while wow, the sun's coming out so for sewing really fine small kind of strings same sort of idea okay I might have to lower my blinds because it's very blindingly bright. Okay, so that's the couching foot and courting foot. Um, this is, oh, we have five minutes. This is a uh, gathering foot. So this one, basically what it does is it has some space underneath so that it can, um, so that it can kind of bunch up the fabric as you sew. So it's a way where you can sew a cool little ruffle thing. There's also such thing as a ruffle foot, which I don't have one of, but it's a little more complex and fancy. If you want a much more fancy kind of gathered ruffle, you might want a ruffle foot, but if you just want a normal little gather, you can do that. So when you do that, you want to set your upper tension really high. Um, your upper thread tension and you want the longer stitch you use the more gathered it will become so those are fun if you're doing ruffles okay let's see um okay let's get through these last few this is a free motion foot it's already call also called an embroidery foot or a darning foot this is where you can do this cool thing called thread painting so if you install that so this is one of the two feet i have where instead of it just being snapping on to this shank thing i actually have to unscrew this like presser foot shank holdery thing and then this screws on instead but what it means is that you can do this really cool kind of it, it when you do that you also have to lower the feed dogs because instead of the feed dogs moving the fabric you move the fabric so it'll, you want to use a slow speed. So if you have an automatic setting for your machine for speed, you use it really slow, but you slowly move the fabric along and then it will stitch and you can basically just kind of like paint with thread and make something pretty cool and unique looking. It doesn't do precise embroidery, but it does like kind of a cool artsy look. So that's what a free motion thread, it, uh, uh, free motion foot is. A lot of fun. I have not used a roller foot, um, but it, it's the same kind of idea um, as a nonstick foot where it rolls on the top layer uh, so that the, the two layers feed on at the same kind of speed. Um, but since I have a nonstick foot and I also have a walking foot, which we're going to cover next, um, I don't have a roller foot. Okay. All right, so now this is another one that needs to clamp on um, with a screw for mine. This crazy, huge, scary contraption is called a walking foot. So a walking foot is, um, it's also similar to doing like a nonstick or a roller foot where it's helping you move the top layer of fabric um, at the same speed as the lower layer of fabric. Because usually the fabric moves by these feed dogs on the bottom pushing it along. Um, but if the presser foot on top is kind of holding something too tightly or something, sometimes if you have a bunch of layers of fabric or different kinds of fabric layered up or something like that, the top layer might not move at the same pace. And so that doing that can mean you're trying to sew something and you get these like pockers or like messed up little things where stuff gets stretched. So in a situation like this, you might want to use a walking foot because it will move them all at the same time. So you get these nice seams like that. Um, so this crazy thing, um, you unscrew this, it goes on. This weird bar thing goes on top of your needle, um, the little bar that holds your needle. You want it to go on there because then when the needle goes down, it moves, which is pretty cool. It's loud and it's weird and it's not very good for doing lots of curves and stuff like that, tight curves, um, but it's very good for using 
in situations where to stop that from happening. <laughs> okay, so that's a walking foot. And then, oh God, I wanna cover two more techniques um, that are nice to know. Your machine might have something called an overlock stitch. Um, an overlock stitch is like a straight stitch where every once in a while it goes, um, it does a zigzag over to the side. Um, what that does is you can use it to encase the raw edge of a fabric. So if you don't have something like a serger and you want to finish a raw edge of fabric so it doesn't fray or so that it's a little more neatly contained, you stitch along and then when the needle goes to the right to do the zigzag stitch, you let it just fall over the edge of the fabric instead of piercing through the fabric. And so that can kind of encase a raw edge. That's called an overlock stitch. And then the last thing I wanted to show is along the clock is chain piecing. So chain piecing is something that's common in patchwork stuff, quilting, but you can use it. I like to use it a lot in fursuit making stuff because it, it basically you sew something and then you just keep sewing onto the next thing and then you can cut them all out by themselves later on. So that's nice because then you don't have to keep stopping and starting and like cutting the threads and this and that. Um, what you want to do, make sure when you're chain piecing, is um, don't let the presser foot just roll by itself over the plate with no, no fabric under it because that can scratch the bottom of your presser foot and damage it over time. So you want to, it to just like roll onto the next piece of fabric as closely as possible. So that's chain piecing and that's my panel. Oh, I made it. I did it all in time. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of CozyCon. I hope that you found some tips that were useful and uh, happy sewing. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>